You know, there isn't much call these days for pilgrims. You open the paper, you look at the want ads, you go on Craigslist or wherever, you know, looking for a job, looking for something to do. They're not looking for pilgrims these days. I don't mean the ones who visit religious sites on tours, they call them pilgrims. If you go to Israel or so on and so forth, you know, they, the uh, tour managers, your tour guide calls you pilgrim uh, because you're visiting the, the holy sites. You know, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about those kind of pilgrims. I mean true pilgrims. You know, people who leave everything behind to go to a new land or a new world to live um, you know, like those who left Europe hundreds of years ago to come to America, those, those kind of pilgrims. You know, unless we colonize some of the planets in our solar system, the pilgrim experience is mostly, uh, it's a thing of the past. Except, of course, when it comes to religion. You see, there is still a pilgrim experience for those who are Christians, that's what we've been singing about here uh, this evening. Of course, uh, there are other religious groups who claim to be on a spiritual journey of sorts, some awaiting some kind of enlightenment, others awaiting an ecstatic moment of rebirth, uh, some waiting for a new world order of some kind. So we're not the only ones talking about being pilgrims. But of these, only Christians are consciously living a transitional life here with the expectation of going to a completely new dimension, a different place, while retaining our full conscious self. We're the only ones waiting to go to another place as ourselves. Hindus, Buddhists, they don't plan on going to the next dimension as themselves. They plan on disappearing and being absorbed into something greater, but not us. We plan on actually knowing who we are in a place that is very different from here. So only Christians see themselves as pilgrims merely passing through this world, this dimension, on a journey that will take them to a completely different place while they remain fully conscious of who they are. That's a unique experience. Only Christians will be conscious of being in a new place while retaining the memory of the old place. This experience makes the Christian life a true pilgrimage. Now the antithesis, the opposite of the pilgrim experience, is the one where a person seeks diligently to find their, uh, their niche, in this world, their spot, their 15 minutes of fame, their place in the sun. The problem, of course, is when a person tries to do both, to be a pilgrim and find their place in this world, they have a problem. You see, the moment you have found your spot in the world, the moment you've carved out a place for yourself, this is the moment the world has found its place in you. And when that happens, your pilgrimage is over. As much as we don't like to hear this, you can't have it both ways. You can't be a pilgrim passing through and at the same time dig a deep foundation for yourself here. You can't do both. This is why the proper relationship between the pilgrimage and this world is that you live in this world but you do so as a pilgrim. And you do so because you belong to and are on your way to another world. You know, so many Christians claim to be pilgrims, but they amass enough stuff to last them two lifetimes in this place. So many Christians claim to be on the pilgrimage, but they spend most of their time and energy carving out a place for themselves here. So many Christians don't realize that if we don't keep the pilgrim spirit alive within us, then we will be tempted to exchange it for a spot in the world that exists here. So this evening I'd like to share with you a few practical ways to keep the pilgrim spirit alive within us so that we all will eventually arrive at our heavenly destination. So how do we keep that pilgrim spirit 
alive. Well, first of all, I would suggest to you that you keep your heart pure. Keep your heart pure. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Matthew 5, verse 8. Now the word pure here means clean or innocent. How does the pilgrim keep his heart pure and clean and innocent? Well, certainly you begin by filling your heart with the word of God. In Colossians 3.16, Paul says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Richly dwell within, not just dwell, richly dwell, lots of it. You know, some people wonder why they're so worldly, why this world is so enticing to them, even though they confess Christ. The answer usually lies in the type of things that they fill their heart with. If all we consume is worldly, then we will become worldly. However, if we make an effort to fill ourselves with the word, if we make an effort to fill ourselves with ideas and thoughts from the word of God, we will maintain the spiritual edge to our character. I'm not saying that we can't consume things. Of course, we have to go to school, we have to learn about math, we have to buy houses and sell houses, and we have to do all, you know, I'm, of course. I'm suggesting to you that, but in order to keep the, the edge the sharp edge of the pilgrim spirit, we also have to consume richly the things of God as well. Another way to keep a pure heart, and that is to maintain your heart with prayer. A pure heart requires the nourishing act of daily prayer to remain attuned to God. Many Christians lose their way, lose their faith, because they don't stay in touch with God through prayer. People have cell phones, email, all kinds of things and other gadgets to stay plugged in to everybody else and everything else in this world, but they neglect to use the avenue of prayer so that they can stay plugged in to God. Someone said to me, you know, how, how do you deal with anger? How do you deal with, you know, you're in the world and you're offended sometimes and people treat you badly or say things that are offensive and make you, how do you deal with that in the world? And my answer is prayer, prayer, always prayer and more prayer. If it's something that really is offensive, really hurtful, really provocative, then it's 24 hours of prayer, an entire cycle of day before I make up my mind on any type of, any type of action. Another way to keep a pure, a pilgrim heart, that is protect your heart against sin. Jesus said that the heart is the source of all manner of evil, murders, adulteries, lies, slander, Matthew 15, 19. The heart is where the plan hatches. <laughs> the resentment is stored in the heart. The anger boils in the heart. The hatred finds a cover in the heart. To keep a pure or innocent heart, the pilgrim needs to consciously and realistically deal with sin every day. And that includes knowing what your sins are. Don't be afraid to think about your sins. Don't be afraid to ask God, please, Lord, reveal my sins to me. I need to know what they are. How can I repent of them if I don't even know what they are? Um, uh, it also includes avoiding situations and people who cause us to sin. Or uh, it, it also involves dealing with our sins with a view uh, to minimize or uh, uh, eliminate them. Really appreciated Marty's lesson this morning. So encouraging, so uplifting, this idea that, hey, we, the, all we have in the church are sinners. And the idea of, I am working to minimize the sin in my life. I may not be able to eliminate all of it, but I can minimize it through the power of the word and the spirit within me and prayer and examination of self, constant, a repentant attitude. A pure heart is not a perfect heart. A pure heart is one that consciously seeks to eliminate the things that hinder the pilgrimage. And so if you want to maintain your pilgrim spirit, you must keep your heart pure. And a pure heart is filled with God's word, is constantly attuned to God in prayer, 
and is consciously making an effort to minimize sin. Um, another way to maintain um, the pilgrim spirit is to keep your mind focused. Keep your mind focused. If you want, uh, take your Bibles and go to James chapter three. Uh, James chapter three, beginning in verse 13. James says it best, he says, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly and natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's James chapter 3, verse 13, 18. You can tell whether a person's mind is focused above or below by examining what their life produces. Very simple. Just, think, just, just take a look at what their life is producing and it'll tell you if they're focused above or below. Now, not all things below are sinful. I didn't say that. But all things from below are from below. Some call themselves Christians, pilgrims, but they spend every moment they have, aside from sleep and work, on worldly activities instead of heavenly activities. A good way to judge your spirituality is to check your agenda, your to-do lists, and you'll quickly see where your focus really is. With God in heaven above or with the busy world below? Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I like that. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be, Matthew 6, 21. So for some, their true treasure is something or some activity that belongs to this earth and this world, which may not in itself be evil or sinful, it's just part of this world. They should rather be crying out to God to give them a hunger and a thirst and a love for spiritual things, but they don't because they love this place more than the place to come. Like Lot's wife, they have a longing for this world and its treasures. The spiritual pilgrim, on the other hand, lives here, succeeds here, enjoys the beauty and the blessings here, but is focused on the things above and the Lord above and will not permit anything from here to interfere with his or her pilgrimage to there. Here's a secret I share with you. You won't be satisfied if you don't hunger and thirst and you'll never hunger and thirst if you don't focus on the things above rather than on the things below. It's not as if all of a sudden you have a hunger for the things above, no. You begin by focusing on the things above and in doing that, you begin to have a greater hunger for those things. And so spiritual pilgrims keep heaven in view at all times and their lives here demonstrate that fact. Finally, to remain a spiritual pilgrim, one other idea, um, I would encourage you to keep pressing on. Keep pressing on. Paul says that he kept pressing on toward the goal in Philippians 3, 14. What do you think his goal was? Well, his goal is the same as our goal. He didn't have a different goal. He may have had a different life and lived in a different time and different culture and so on, different opportunities, different challenges, but his goal is the same as our goal. Our goal is to, you know, Go to heaven to be with Christ. That was his goal. And he said he kept pressing on towards that goal. You know, one thing I've noticed about pilgrims, they don't settle until they've arrived at their destination. That's for earthly pilgrims, 
and it's for, it's for spiritual pilgrims as well. The people that went out west to settle the west. You know, had they stopped in Chicago, that's where, you know, that's where the country would have, but they pressed on until they made it to their destination. They stay for a while, but they move on. Now when I was younger, I used to think that this meant that a spiritual pilgrim had to go from place to place, from one work to another. So for about the first 15 years of my ministry, I, I did move around a lot from one work to another. I'd start a work and get it going over here, and then I'd move on to another church that needed help and you know, work with them for a few years. As I grew older, however, I came to understand that although the Lord does lead us to different places and circumstances for various reasons, this is the exception, not the rule. The Israelites, they wandered in the desert, yes, for 40 years because of their own sin, but they remained in the same land for over 1,500 years in order to accomplish God's purpose. So I've understood that being a spiritual pilgrim has more to do with the direction of your will than the direction of your wandering. For example, the Lord calls pilgrims to move from disbelief to belief. That's a, that's a journey, from disbelief to belief. The Lord calls on pilgrims to move from service based on duty to service and submission based on love. That's a journey. He calls on us to move from hearing His word to searching His word. You see the journey? He calls on us uh, to move from regular prayer to intercessory prayer. Notice the journey, the pilgrimage there. From learning a ministry to leading and teaching others how to minister. From a religious exterior to the heart of a true spiritual pilgrim. In other words, the journey is within, not without. But the spiritual journey within, however, will ultimately take your whole mind and your whole soul and your whole body to places you would never imagine you would be. If someone told me when I was 25 years old that, that when I would be 66 years old, I'd be a preacher for the Church of Christ in Choctaw, Oklahoma, first of all, I would not have known what a preacher was, and I had never heard of the Church of Christ, and I couldn't find Oklahoma on a map you know, if you paid me. I, I, I couldn't have even understood what a preacher was. A French, Italian, Catholic growing up in Quebec, are you kidding me? I could not even conceive of such a thing. I could, I could you know, imagine a young guy growing up in Dallas you know, when he's 25 and say, well, when I was 25 I didn't know what I wanted to do, but then I became a preacher. Well, at least he knew what a preacher was. I had no idea what a preacher was, a minister. I didn't even know what that was. So you can't imagine where God will take you if you begin the journey. The key, of course, is movement. If you're not pressing on within, then there isn't any pilgrimage, no matter how much movement there is on the outside. And so as I close out this lesson this evening, I ask you to examine your lives and ask yourself two very basic questions. The first question is this, am I truly a pilgrim? Do I have the pilgrim spirit? Have I begun the journey that will take me from this world to the next world. Well, the first step of this pilgrim journey, of course, begins with the decision to confess our faith in Jesus and to step forward into the waters of baptism. I often tell people, the first step you take in the Christian life is a step down into the water. That's the first step you take. It's not the only step you take, but it is always the first step that you take. And so, am I a pilgrim? Have I begun that journey? Have I taken the first step to begin? And then the other question is this, am I living as a pilgrim or have I kind of settled down here and gotten comfortable 
in the world. You know, when Moses wanted to lead the Jews into the promised land, many refused to go because they had become used to life in Egypt, even though they were slaves. And the Bible tells us once they were out in the desert and they were freed and they saw all the miracles and everything and when things got a little rough, they wanted to go back. <laughs> they wanted to actually go back into slavery because they were used to that. They were used to the food, they were used to the harsh, they were used to it. We will never reach our destination of heaven if we don't really want to leave this world behind. And so I ask you this evening, decide, brethren, decide. Decide where you want to go. Decide which place you wish to be at. Decide what are you? Are you really a spiritual pilgrim? And are you making headway in your movement towards the goal that all of us are seeking? And that is eternal life with Christ. If you need help to make that decision, if you need help to take that very first step as a pilgrim, the water is ready, the church is gathered to be a witness, the angels in heaven are waiting. All it requires is for you to say yes to Jesus Christ tonight. If you need to do that, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing.